Kwai Nidebek Nil Tiliwisi Bamused Muin Jamie Bissonette Louis Gwenik Palomio Nil Abiniki. I don't ever remember a time when I didn't work. When I was three years old, I was placed on top of a chair next to my auntie so that I could dry the dishes. There was little chance I could do any harm. Our dishes were Melmac and our cups were aluminum. And I loved these times because my auntie would teach me songs and she would tell me stories. She told me about the man she was falling in love with, the man that would eventually become my uncle. But this was also work. Often we had as many as 12 people at the table, and there were a lot of dishes. But I had been taught that my responsibility was to contribute to the family that I was blessed to be born into. And as I grew, my capacity to contribute to that family grew along with me. And I began to excel in certain areas. One of the areas that I excelled in was fishing. Now, for many of you, maybe fishing is recreation. For us, it was sustenance. We would go out ice fishing, and we would collect catch 200, 400. I remember one day when we caught 500 fish. And we brought them home, and the work of cleaning and packaging them would begin. And more stories, more laughter, more time as a family building the life we wanted to share. Last spring, my husband and I had the blessing of meeting with Justice Raymond Austin. Justice Austin is the foremost Navajo customary law specialist in the country. He's also a former Navajo Supreme Court Justice. And he asked us a question, one question. He asked us what we wanted our descendants to know 200 years from now. Our answer was quick, the language. And then he res his response to us was even quicker. He said, then everything you do every day must be to that end so that your descendants 200 years from now have the language. I'm the chair of the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission. We deal with complex political issues, tribal state issues, sovereignty. And everything I do every day must be to that end that my descendants 200 years from now will know the language. And I realized that word sovereignty has no translation in my language. In fact, I don't think that word exists in any indigenous language. It is wholly a European concept. And as I thought about that, I remembered the teachings of Ingrid Washiniwa Watuk Al Isa. Ingrid taught us that indigenous sovereignty is the wafting thread of a tapestry. Now, the wafting thread maintains the integrity of the tapestry, it articulates its beauty, and it locks the threads in place. Our language holds the integrity of our country. It reflects the beauty and wealth of our culture. And it is that wafting thread that locks the customary law articulated in ceremony in place. And I thought about George Stevens a quiet, gentle, Passamaquoddy man who held that wafting thread. Father of 16, 
decorated war veteran. Holding that thread, George decided he had to expand his garden so that he could better feed his children. He went out with shovels and pickaxe to dig a new perimeter, and a white man came up to him and said, you can't do that. That's my land, and I'm bringing a road through here. George says, that, this can't be your land. This is Passamaquoddy land. Well, the conversation got heated, and this gentle Passamaquoddy man, father of 16, decorated war veteran, was arrested and taken to jail. A few days later, his wife, Pauline, noticed that the man had made good on his threat and bulldozers had arrived on the property and dirt was being moved across their garden. And she and three of her friends did the only thing they could think of doing. They rushed from their homes and they sat on this dirt pile. They were not revolutionaries. They were not political people. These were housewives dressed in house dresses and aprons, sitting on a pile of dirt, clutching that wafting thread. Responsibility and sacrifice. And they were arrested. The sacrifice of these five good Passamaquoddy people sparked a decade-long struggle for the return of the homeland. And eventually, the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot would bring suit against the state of Maine and lay claim to two-thirds of the land base. And against all odds, they won at every level of appeal, because indeed the land had been stolen from them. And eventually, President Carter was forced to negotiate. And the result of that negotiation was an agreement and two laws. The first law passed was the state law, the main implementing act. And this law closely reflected U.S. Federal Resolution 109, the law of termination. Now the law of termination was exactly that. It terminated 109 federally recognized tribes. And it did this by stripping them of their federal recognition and subjecting them entirely to state law and state regulation. Now the main law did not strip the tribes of federal recognition because it was in the state's interest that the tribes be able to receive federal resources and federal dollars. But it did subject them entirely to state law and state regulation. But that law, the main law, could not become law until Congress gave permission for its enactment. So Passamaquoddy and Penobscot representatives, George Stevens among them, went to Washington, D.C., and they won concessions. The most important concession that they won was an articulation of what they had reserved and what they had relinquished. And what they had reserved were the sustenance, fishing, hunting, gathering rights, access to the land, access to the water, <coughs> access to the ocean. What they had reserved was that wafting thread indigenous sovereignty. And so what has happened since then? The state has utterly ignored and contravened the federal law four times. The courts have issued decisions that have words like, a deal is a deal. You made your bed, lie in it. In 2012, 
the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission decided to look at the impact of the implementation of these laws. And what we discovered was that there has developed in the state of Maine a humanitarian crisis. You see, Wabanaki people live an average of 25 years less than other citizens in the state of Maine. If you are Passamaquoddy and you live in Indian Township, you can expect an average lifespan of 48 to 52 years. If you cross the bridge into Princeton, you can expect to live for 72 years. And what does this mean for the Wabanaki? Those who are the wisdom keepers, the elders, those who carry the wafting thread, who have the time and space to teach the customary law embedded in our ceremonies, are leaving far too soon. And when the Tribal State Commission presented this information to the United Nations, they examined it carefully, and they concurred that indeed a humanitarian crisis was taking place in the state of Maine. And they issued a warning to the US government stating that they must address this. So where does that leave all of us today? Because we all have responsibilities, and in all of our traditions, I believe there probably is a wafting thread. I turn to the teachings of Walter Echohawk. And Walter tells us that there's a tried and true method of making things right. There are shared wisdom teachings, wisdom teachings we all have no matter what religious or cultural tradition that we may live within. And those wisdom teachings teach us that when we have done a wrong, there's a five-step process to correcting it. First, we must acknowledge that a wrong has taken place. And that has begun to happen here in Maine with the Tribal State Commission acknowledging and explaining the humanitarian crisis, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission declaring that an ongoing cultural genocide is taking place right now here in the state of Maine. But an acknowledgment is not enough. When we've really searched and we've really understood what is wrong and what has happened, it's important to own that. It's important to apologize with good intent and with integrity and with the promise of making it right. And I do believe that if those two things are done, <clears throat> the third step will also take place, and that is an acceptance of the apology. But it's not enough to acknowledge, apologize, and accept. We must work together to make things right. We can't make things the same. We can't turn back the hands of time, but we can go a long way in making things right. And if we go through this process together, acknowledgement, apology, acceptance, designing what would actually make things right, we will develop a relationship and I like to pray that on that relationship, that vision we have for our descendants 200 years from now will come true and they will be standing strong holding that same wafting thread. Kichiwaliwana.